Okay, let's start uh, while people are still joining. Um, so I want to welcome you all to this research colloquium, the first one in 2024. My name is Anna Lyshanowski. I am the current vice chair of AES Germany, and I'm happy and it's my great pleasure to introduce today uh, Jürgen Herre and Sascha Dick, uh, who will speak on the topic of perceptual audio coders, what to listen for, and their recently updated tutorial that was created by the AES Technical Committee on Coding of Audio Signals. Before we start, there's a short advertisement block. Um, so if you're interested in the section, the AES Germany section, our work, or you want to be notified about local and online events, uh, please check the QR codes. They will guide you to our newsletter, website, and also further information about the AES. Then this event, as you might have noticed, is organized by the AS Germany section. This is us. And as you can see, there are people missing. So I want to take this opportunity to uh, yeah, advertise a regional leader position uh, for Stuttgart. Um, so if you are based in Stuttgart and if you're interested in joining, uh, helping out with yeah, organizing local events, etc., or if you're interested to learn more about the work of a regional leader, reach out to us. And one last thing, as I said, this is the first research colloquium in 2024, and we would like to have more this year. So if you want to be a presenter, whether you are a professional or a student, we invite you to present your work and to contribute to this exchange of knowledge that we have here. If you're a colleague, if you have a colleague who deserves recognition, nominate them to present, or you can also organize a research uh, panel, a panel discussion. Um, so if you're interested in that, or if you have any other ideas related to the research colloquium, write us an email to info at asgermany.org, or you can also contact me directly using vice chair at asgermany.org. So before we continue, a few organizational things. Um, as you realize, the colloquium will be held in English. It is divided in two parts. So the first part, there is a presentation in form of a webinar session that will be recorded. And then there's a second part um, where we have an unrecorded Q&A and a discussion. And between those two sessions, we have to switch meeting rooms. So this is important. Um, you'll find a link to the Q&A uh, in the chat. So we'll share this link over and over again. So please join us in this other meeting room if you want to be part of the Q&A session and discussion and if you want to ask questions. So if you have any questions during the presentation, you can already put them into the chat or the Q&A um, and we'll bring them up later in the other meeting room. So who are our guests? I'm honored to introduce our guests today, Jürgen Herre and Sascha Dick. Uh, Jürgen has earned his degree in electrical engineering from FAU in Erlangen, followed by a PhD for his work on error concealment of coded audio. He joined the Fraunhofer Institute for Integrated Circuits and became a co-developer of the iconic MP3 codec, codec uh, after a postdoc term at Bell Laboratories focused on the development of AEC, he returned to Fraunhofer IIS, where he currently serves as a chief executive scientist for the audio and multimedia activities. In September 2010, uh, he was appointed professor at the University of Erlangen and the International Audio Laboratories Erlangen. He is an expert in low bitrate audio coding, perceptual audio coding, spatial audio coding, and many, many more. And he's a fellow member of the AES, co-chair of the AES Technical Committee on Coding of Audio Signal, and vice chair of the AES Technical Council. Sasha Dick received his degree in information and communication technologies, also from the FAU in Erlangen-Nürnberg. He joined Fraunhofer IAS, where he contributed to the development and standardization of audio codecs such as MPEG-H3D audio, and in 2023, so last year, he received his PhD degree for his work on psychoacoustic effects for 3D audio from FAU 
and has recently been awarded the Hugo Geiger Prize for his outstanding dissertation. So congratulations to this, Sasha. He has since joined Fraunhofer IIS again to further pursue research and development of 3D audio applications. And he has become a AIS fellow for his role as editor of the Perceptual Audio Coders What to Listen For web edition tutorial, which they are going to introduce to us today. And with this, I'll hand over to you, Jürgen and Sascha, and I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Anna. So let me try to share my screen and uh, get all the audio things right here. Yes, I think it should work. So hopefully you should see my uh, screen now yes. and slides. We can see it. Oh yeah. All right. Very good. Okay. So um, thank you very much once again for that uh, kind introduction. So today we're going to talk about this perceptual audio code is what to listen for, which is a, a quite useful package of educational material. And so it's mm -hmm. both me that will talk about it. I'm going to do more the introductionary and background part. As, as Anna said before, I work for the International Audio Labs Erlangen, which is a joint institution between Fraunhofer IIS and Erlangen Nuremberg University and the editor of the package, Sasha Dick. Now, let's see, uh, what is the background for all of that? So, um, perceptual audio coding has become a, a key part in, in worldwide music distribution and, and in communication. So there's lots of applications, music download, streaming, wireless or wired, internet radio, digital TV, digital audio broadcasting, internet telephony and video conferencing and what have you. So uh, I'm sure and every one of us has lots of devices where um, low bitrate audio coding plays a big role and uh, so be it um, a cell phone, be it um, a tablet computer, be it PC or be it DVD players or some things like that. And uh, now as, as the 90s, when things started to really evolve, are quite a while ago. But since then, there has been a lot of progress in the area. And uh, here's one little diagram that I always use to show in my audio coding lecture at the university. So if you start um, with a bit rate that you think is enough for good quality stereo coding, and this is not perfect quality stereo coding. So you would say, okay, well, let's use MP3 at 128 kilobits. So that is pretty good. It's by no means perfect, but yes. And if you then uh, go on to see how bit rates for the same quality evolved over time, so you could see with every few more years, uh, there was a decrease in necessary bit rate. Um, going down here so that the charts actually stops here at USAC uh, from 2012, but you see the big de uh, decrease here. Uh, and there's, there's uh, we already touched on that, there's lots of popular audio codecs that, for instance, came out of ISO MPEG, that is the international standardization efforts, but there's also other kind of codecs that were um, successful in the market. and. Um, well, what do they have in common? There's one thing that you could say, and here is the principle or the basic paradigm of uh, low bitrate audio coding. And that is depicted in this, um, um, in, in this uh, picture here. So if you look at the encoder, so there's audio coming in, that is PCM, it could be coming from a wave file. It goes through an analysis filter bank that splits everything into spectral components. You could actually say subsample spectral components. Then um, those spectral components, rather than time domain samples, are quantized safeguards, and they're coded, entropy coded, to get into a really compact uh, form and into finally put into the bitstream, which could be the uh, .mp3 file. Now that, that is a codec, uh, a coder here. Uh, the thing that makes it a perceptual audio coder is that there's a perception model that really looks at to at what the ear is perceiving and at this moment in time 
and uh, compute something that we call the masking threshold. And that really uh, influences the quantization process such that the, um, the error that has to be done unavoidably if we're going to low bit rates is minimized in its audibility. Now, uh, on the decoder side, we have the opposite process. So we get the bits per min, we take it apart, we um, rescale it to the uh, original size. So please uh, apologize the misleading and uh, um, term of inverse quantization because it's obviously known that quantization cannot be reversed. But the last step is the mapping from spectral domain to time domain and the synthesis for the bank. And, uh, now, um, that is what you see as a textbook diagram in each uh, audio coding lecture. And it actually is pretty much what actual audio codecs were looking like around 1990. So MPV, for instance, quite uh, closely follows that structure. The, the secret of success here is really that the psychoacoustics um, uh, controlled by the perception model is used to shape the coding error. So that was the revolutionary new thing that made, made a big, big difference. Now let's see um, what that means. So that is another diagram that you see frequently uh, when going to audio coding textbooks. So there's this phenomenon of simultaneous masking. What does it mean? So here's a diagram of um, of uh, that is given in sound pressure level and decibels as a function of here a logarithmic frequency axis. And you see one curve here, which is the so-called threshold and quiet. And that means everything that is below this threshold in that, time, in that um, spectral representation is inaudible. So that means for low thresholds as low frequencies and for very high frequencies, we're pretty insensitive. Highest sensitivity here being around two, three, four kilohertz. Now that is that is quite um, clear. What is a little bit more, um, yeah, non-obvious is that if we put um, a kind of mask, a kind of tone, or actually a narrowband noise in that particular example, into that uh, picture that is we are not playing in the absolute silent room, but we're playing a 250 hertz narrow point, uh, band masking uh, noise signal. And uh, then it means that this threshold curve, threshold and quiet is deformed into a kind of bell-shaped curve that is centered around the masker signal. And that means that everything that is in this vicinity and uh, lies um, below that curve is inaudible. So. Uh, that all sounds pretty abstract. You, however, know all these things from daily life, from your experience, because, um, well, if you walk along the country side, there's uh, on, the, on the road uh, side, there, you could hear birds chirping, but as soon as, as their truck is passing by, they will be masked. That is that kind of phenomenon. But if you apply that, or digital signal processing, you get to sort of a little something, uh, kind of black magic. And uh, the best thing I can do here in that context is that I play a good, good old uh, demo, which we call the 13 dB miracle. So that thing is a historic demonstration by Jim Johnston and Karl Heinz Brandenburg. One they've been using together, uh, working together at at and Bell Labs in 1990. And we're using the best psychoacoustic model that was available to them at that point in time. So what is that about? So when I hit that play button, we're going to uh, listen to different uh, sound signals. First, we start with an original. So that is a song by Paul Simon uh, from the Graceland record. And um, so first, that's original. Then we listen to the original plus a kind of simulated coding noise. And the coding noise means that within short segments of say 20 milliseconds, uh, the noise level uh, is adjusted such at, that in each of those blocks, there's a signal to noise ratio of about 13 or 14 dB. 
is maintained. Now, the difference is uh, signal number two does that with white noise. So that is something that would happen if you would quantize in time domain. That's the way it would happen in, uh, with a very, very simple codec. But what is re what we really do is that we try to shape that noise and exploit our ability to shape noise over the spectral um, yeah, envelope of a frequency. And so um, we're doing the same now with psychoacoustical shape noise, of the same as in R, um, but um, the shape of the noise is now adapted to, to the masking official. So that is signal number three. And because it may not be quite obvious what kind of error signals are introduced uh, into those signals, so uh, we afterwards play just the different signals. So the error signal of uh, signal number two and that of signal number three. So let me kind of, uh, let me play that. No, second signal. No. First point to second. So to me, that demonstration is always still striking, still after so many years. And so it's quite clear that the second signal is totally unusable. It's uh, annoyingly distorted. Whereas the third signal, we cannot can hardly distinguish, if at all, from the original. And you could see uh, that this white noise signal, uh, actually, it does not sound like the music signal itself. It is like uh, rhythmically modulated with the original signal, but that's it. Whereas the third signal uh, that contains uh, an error signal, which is almost, you could even, even understand the lyrics of the original singing. So that is what makes it uh, able to be hidden nicely as a masked uh, kind of component underneath the musical signal. So what we can learn from that is that this impact of using psychoacoustic noise shaping really makes a big, big, big difference. And conversely, uh, there's, there's still people out there that try to measure um, the performance of perceptual audio codecs with signal to noise ratio. And you could see quite obviously that if you do these sophisticated noise, uh, perceptual noise shaping techniques, it, uh, the SNR does not say anything adequately about uh, subjective sound quality. So that is something that sets the background uh, for what we are observing frequently. And by the way, here's a little slide of courtesy from Thomas Sporer, um, where we see uh, the graphical representation of uh, what we heard. So we have, a, in this case, a linear frequency axis and the average spectra of those signals. So you could see the original signal spectrum averaged over time. We can uh, see the white noise averaged over time. And you could hear the, see that the white noise spectrum is much larger in its power spectral density than the signal actually uh, when it comes to high frequencies, a few kilohertz and, and above. Whereas there's a lot of um, headroom in the low frequencies. Conversely, if we're looking at the shaped noise, that really pushes down um, the the um, noise contributions at high frequencies, so they're masked properly, and uses the available headroom in the uh, low frequency range. So that makes a difference. But both, uh, if you would plot it into linear um, 
kind of scaling would have the same arrow area. Sorry, sorry. Now, um, uh, as we see, perceptual noise shaping is a very powerful approach. Still, if the bit rate, if we as users select a really low bit rate for a perceptual audio coder, there will be signal alterations. We call them artifacts, and they could be very subtle, and they could be also very severe. I've, I have um, collected some examples to listen to. So let's first listen to an original. Now, listen to that flavor, which is a coded, decoded flavor. That already quite distorted or not so much. Listen, let's listen to another flavor. Well, that, that's way more obvious, but uh, yeah, it's not quite clear what kind of uh, process is happening here. And I'm not going to tell you right now because later on, Sasha will uh, guide you through these kinds of things. I'll merely give you one more example here, an original first. Die Natur hat den Menschen eine Zunge, aber zwei Ohren gegeben, auf das wir doppelt so viel hören wie sprechen können. In diesem Ausspruch eines antiken Philosophen steckt vielleicht ein Teil Wunschdenken, aber es ist auch ein Teil Wahrheit darin enthalten. Die Natur hat dem Menschen eine Zunge, aber zwei Ohren gegeben, auf das wir doppelt so viel hören wie sprechen können. In diesem Ausspruch eines antiken Philosophen steckt vielleicht ein Teil Wunschdenken, aber es ist auch ein Teil Wahrheit darin enthalten. So could, would you detect these kind of artifacts and would you even be able to categorize and recognize them? Of course, we have to acknowledge that now uh, this audio connection goes via the internet. That means there's one more perceptual audio codec in between. <laughs> That's what PowerPoint does sometimes. All right, so you just heard me um, doing the introduction and motivation. Uh, here's an overview of our menu today. So I will give one more little uh, chapter here that is uh, talk about the history of the tutorial. Then we're gonna have a tutorial walkthrough uh, interactively given by, by Sasha. And I will finally wrap up. Now, um, as you may have heard in, in the beginning, uh, I'm uh, co-chair of the AS Technical Committee on coding, coding of Audio Signals. And in that committee, um, we try to do useful things for the public and useful things for education in our field. And so at some point, we had the idea to make an educational tutorial on what kind of artifacts perceptual audio coders could have. So that uh, there was a pioneer uh, amongst other people by Marcus Erne. Um, and uh, so in two, as a result of that effort, um, in 2001, there was this original CD came ROM came out with this tutorial information and audio examples, and it got quite popular. Until not too long time ago, you could uh, get that picture at the AS Web Store, and uh, so there were several uh, printings of that CD ROM, which was both uh, playable on a standard Redbook C compatible CD player and on a, <clears throat> a computer. So that was the first generation. Uh, but then after now about 20 years of advances in audio coding and reproduction technology, we felt we should um, set up a new edition of that tutorial and, and create an updated uh, edition, which we called now, for the lack of a better name, web edition. So we went to a really physical form of physical media to something that would display nicely on contemporary devices. 
And uh, so on one hand, the original format has been this hybrid CD-ROM format. Uh, we now uh, went to uh, a web and downloadable format for easy access. So we had a new web design for a modernized look and feel. Uh, so it's adaptive. So uh, should adaptively uh, um, uh, display correctly on your cell phone. It's mobile friendly for tablets and smartphones. And uh, <clears throat> also looks a little bit nicer here. Um, the the CD-ROM was an item that had was sold uh, by AES uh, uh, web shop, but the web edition was then first uh, made available only on the web and to AES members only. And now, um, f f since uh, well, I'm not sure <laughs> how many months ago. Uh, we're, ha we're happy happy to have the free public access to the tutorial now, and you could either uh, just run it as online from uh, from the website with easy browsing, but you also uh, can uh, use for offline use and desktop use. You can download it here, and that is um, the important um, URL to to uh, note down. I will display it again in the end, and I uh, saw it is part of our web announcement here for the webinar. And now uh, it's time for me to uh, to give the, the screen and the floor to Sasha, who will give our tutorial walkthrough on the, on the package here. So please, Sasha. Thank you. Let me share my screen. So I hope you can all see the screen. So um, yeah, if you follow that link, you will be um, directed to our nice AES web page. And there you find a trailer basically for our announcement and the links to the web edition where you can online browse that tutorial or also put that on your listen, uh, view that on your mobile device and you can download the package and view it offline on your PC. I have here the download version, which I will now give you a short walkthrough because of course there is a lot of different things which are in there. And I would like to pick out a few selected chapters to yeah, give you a bit more insight into actual audio coding artifacts, but also to show off some of the features that our new web edition of this tutorial um, provides. And first of all, we here on the left see the menu with all the different chapters that we have. We have basically for each different type of artifact, one chapter, there's one on aliasing, on band limitation, birdies, binaural unmasking, but also newly added content on parametric coding. I will go into a bit more detail on all of those later, but also here below, we have actually some additional links to other tutorials and informative links for further reading. Um, but now I would like to give you a walkthrough through some selected um, chapters. First of all, I would like to talk a bit about tandem coding as we have just heard. Basically, perceptual audio coding works by shaping quantization noise in a way that um, it is masked by the actual signal. However, since we basically introduce noise, which is just at the masking threshold, if you were to actually repeat that process, um, the small changes that are introduced with each coding step would add up. And this is actually um, also the example that Jürgen showed earlier, but I would like to show it in a bit more detail. So here we would have the original signal. Um, and now if you run that through an audio coder just once, well, you can hear it sounds still very good. I'm not sure if over the Zoom um, additional coding connection you can actually hear 
much of a difference, but overall it sounds very good. However, if you repeat that process and code it again and again, for instance here with three times you can, already start hearing some more degradations. Yeah, I think you can already hear that it is not as clear anymore as the original and it's already a bit more warbly and yeah, grainy, especially compared to the original. I will not play that again in full length, but now if you go even further and let's say code it six time, it already becomes quite obvious. Uh, and if we drive that even further and in the end would have actually 10 generations of coding and decoding, coding, decoding, then it is really obviously degraded in quality. Okay, I think you can clearly hear that this is quite bad. And of course, this is not something that you would usually do until this point, but I think it's a very nice example of how these small changes can gradually degrade the signal more and more and become more and more audible. And of course, this is now basically a full audio coder running end to end several times. And therefore it's kind of a collection of different types of coding artifacts that can occur and are here amplified and amplified to become very obvious. And I think it's good for getting an overall feeling how a um, perceptually coded signal can be changed by the coding. However, I would now like to go a bit more into detail about some of the aspects that are all found within this types of degradation. First of all, um, I would like to walk you a bit here through the chapter on band limitation and birdies. First of all, band limitation, well, that's the very classic thing that you would do if you want to reduce bitrate. What you can do is, of course, just limit the bandwidth of the audio signal. And that's also something that would traditionally happen in um, analog transmission like radio or telephone, where you basically just cut off the audio bandwidth. And I think you all know how low pass filtering or bandwidth limitation sounds. I will still play you a very short example here. So this was the original, which you have now heard a few times. And if you go to, let's say four kilohertz bandpass limitation, which is telephone quality, you will really notice very obviously that all of the high frequencies are gone and it sounds really muffled. So this is to some extent also something that can happen in perceptual audio coding just because the higher frequencies are typically, yeah, the, the hearing limits go down there. So there's just some amount of frequency that can be cut off, but of course it shouldn't be overdone. Otherwise it becomes um, obvious. However, the more interesting artifact that is explained in this chapter is the so-called birdie artifacts. As we have just heard, um, perceptual audio coding actually works by quantizing the spectrum uh, or the signal in the spectral domain. So in the frequency domain, and what we see here is a um, time frequency spectrogram with the time and the frequency of a coded signal. And what can actually happen when quantizing a signal is that of course, quantization is not just additive noise, but actually if you quantize very coarsely, you will start quantizing some parts of the signal 
to zero, which is the area that is in blue here. So um, yeah, actually this is also some of the um, features that I can show off here of our new web edition, which is basically a spectrogram view where you can toggle between different variants of the signal. And here is the original signal. And here is the quantized signal. And as you can see, basically here in the high frequency regions, much is gone, but still there are some, especially parts where there's more energy which remain. However, what you can also see is that here marked with the arrows that actually sometimes, well, depending on the energy, the quantization sometimes leaves in some part of the spectrum and sometimes takes it away. And this gives an additional yeah, spectral islands, which we call also birdie artifacts because it has this kind of warbly or even chirping sensation. And I will play you an example for that, which is this audio signal, first the original. Selfish and mean and everything I did. And now I will show you just a severely distorted version, which is here this coarse quantization that you see here below. Selfish and mean and everything I did. And I think you can clearly hear that it gets this warbly characteristic and it becomes unstable and of course it also has a bit less energy in the high frequencies but the the most noticeable thing is this temporal instability and to further illustrate this effect here is another example which just uses a very simple chord which is synthesized from um, some uh, sinusoids and here would be the chord just in the original version. Yeah. yeah, just a very simple synthesized chord. And now if you would just do some quantization, for instance, which is um, consistent over time, which would, let's say, just remove one of the harmonic lines out of that, co uh, of that chord, it would sound something like this. Yeah, so if you compare it to the original, it, it has maybe a bit a different timbre, but overall it sounds pretty similar, I would say. However, if you now would have some kind of quantization that is not stable over time, as it is simulated here, where this um, missing line toggles on and off, then you will start noticing very much the difference in how that sounds. And yeah, I think you can clearly hear that this tone, which was in the original chord already included, since it's now toggling on and off, you start actually perceiving it as an additional signal rather than part of the original signal. And to a lesser extent, that is actually the effect that is going on with these birdie artifacts that part of the originally coded spectrum, if they are sometimes removed and sometimes not, you actually hear them like, well, small birds that chirp in addition to the original signal rather than being part of the actual coded spectrum. Um, and yeah, if you want, of course, there are some more examples in this chapter that you can listen to yourself if you want. I would like to move on here to another effect, which we know from um, transform coding or, or coding in the spectral domain, which is the so-called pre-echoes. Again, a bit background on that. To do this coding in the spectral domain, in the frequency domain, we need some kind of time to frequency transformation. And for that, usually a blockwise processing with some overlap is done, but we take basically blocks of some transform length to transform from time domain and frequency domain and do frequency domain quantization based on the perceptual model that um, generates or, or calculates the masking thresholds. However, if we have such a blockwise processing and the blocks are rather large, what can happen if we have a rather transient signal 
is that actually the quantization noise from the frequency domain is um, distributed over the whole block in the time domain. And for yeah, less transient signals, that's actually not really a problem because if a signal is temporally stable, it will also distribute the quantization noise nicely over that signal. However, if you have something with a sharp onset or attack, which is shown here, and we code that in a block-based fashion, then what you can see here is the coded signal that gets the additional quantization noise, which is distributed over the whole um, audio block. And here in the kind of decay tail of that signal, this doesn't really matter, but the part that comes in before the actual attack, um, here again, the, it's shown a bit amplified the noise. Um, this is actually something that will become audible because it's not really masked by that actual attack. And therefore it's audible as what we call a pre-echo effect. And for that, I would like to also show you an example, which is the typical pre-echo example, which is a castanet signal playing. Here is the original. And now here is a version that is coded with a rather long block size and the quantization noise is smeared over those blocks. And I think you can really clearly hear that the um, original very sharp attacks of the castanets are not getting this additional pre-echo or, or temporal smearing on them. And this is also something that we can see here in our nicely um, interactive spectrogram view. So here we have a spectrogram of the original of one of the castanet hits. You can see here the clear onset and that decay over time. And if you have the um, coded version of that, you can toggle between these two if you click on the spectrogram. And here you can see that this originally very clear transient onset is now smeared towards earlier. And this additional kind of sharp attack line is what you would then perceive as kind of a pre-echo. Um, and yeah, there's of course ways also here described how this can be avoided in coding, but I think that's something for your own reading and not um, for the scope of this overview and walkthrough here. However, an um, related effect that I would like to show you, which is also coming from this temporal smearing of um, quantization noise is the so-called speech reverberation artifacts. And if you think of what happens to this castanet, this of course happens also to other signals that have some kind of transient components, like for instance, speech. But of course, speech does not have that sharp transients like the castanets would have, but still it has structure and sharp onsets, but there the perception of that temporal smearing is a bit different and it sounds more like a reverberation. And in that chapter, I would like to also show you another nice feature that we have now in this web edition, which is this kind of matrix style player where we have the unprocessed original. And then we have actually different types of processing with two parameters that are varied. Um, here is the ed edit, uh, I think, no, that's the noise to mask ratio. And this here is the fil um, filter block length or the, the window size. So this basically means we have here a parameter that scales the strength of the noise and a parameter that scales to the length of the noise. And we can here listen to different variations on the interactions of those two um, parameters. I, would, I will not go into full detail here, but I'll show you one or two examples, which are actually, you may recognize it from Jürgen's slide earlier. And then you can, of course, try out yourself how different combinations of that sound. So here is the original speech signal. Die Natur hat dem Menschen eine Zunge, aber zwei Ohren gegeben. 
auf das wir doppelt so viel hören wie sprechen können. And now here is the version with the strongest impact with very high noise and a long filter bank, uh, well, window length, filter bank band stuff. Die Natur hat dem Menschen eine Zunge, aber zwei Ohren gegeben, auf das wir doppelt so viel hören wie sprechen können. And here you can hear how this additional yeah, kind of whispering sound comes in addition to the original um, speech. And if you would have the same um, strength of noise, but at a shorter block length and therefore less temporal smearing, you can also listen to that and you will notice that it's already much less audible if the temporal extent of the noise is shorter. Die Natur hat dem Menschen eine Zunge, aber zwei Ohren gegeben, auf das wir doppelt so viel hören wie sprechen können. And here are of course several variations of that that you can listen in this matrix form. So those were now some examples that um, can occur as artifacts in, I would say, classical audio coding and which were also included in the original CD-ROM version of that tutorial. But now also nowadays we have actually more modern codecs which use so-called parametric coding tools or techniques. And without going into too deep of detail here, the general idea is in parametric coding that instead of trying to code the actual signal, we try to more or less just transmit parameters. And so to analyze the signal and transmit parameters that can be used then to synthesize some signals that let's say perceptually sound similar to what the original signal would have been. And for that, we have here several new chapters in our web edition of the tutorial, which is perceptual noise substitution, bandwidth extension, and parametric stereo and multi-channel coding. And from that, I would like to select the perceptual noise substitution chapter and show you a bit of that. Um, and the others, you can of course then have a look at yourself or if time allows, I will maybe go into one more here. So for perceptual noise substitution, the idea is basically that we say, well, in the higher frequencies, the perception or the, the resolution of human hearing is already quite coarse. So the idea is instead of actually transmitting the signal there, can't we just transmit the spectral envelope of the signal and then just generate noise and shape that to have the same spectral temporal en envelope. And then we still get some high end um, signal, but we don't really need to code that much information. And for that, I would also like to show you a few examples. First of all, for the signal that we already knew here, which is yeah, basically a rather full spectrum and also has lots of noise like components. So we would, we can expect that actually replacing things which are already noise like will work quite well because we actually cannot distinguish between different types of noise. We are not measuring actually SNR to an original, but to the ear noise is noise basically if it has the same energy and spectral shape. So let's listen to the original here. And now to a version where all frequencies above eight kilohertz have just been replaced by noise with the same spectral envelope. And I would say that this works pretty, pretty good. And this is now really still very close to the original. And even if we go down much further and let's say go down here to two kilohertz and replace everything above two kilohertz with noise. Yeah, here, I think you can already 
clearly hear that this is not longer the original and already somewhat different, but um, it's still somewhat usable that if you, I would say, maybe listen to it on a kitchen radio, it might be okay. But of course, as with all things, if you overdo it and go down here to 500 hertz, then it will sound very different from the original. Let me play this one. Yeah, so compared to the original, yeah, here you can see that it, or hear rather that it sounds obviously different and it's actually more or less like it's playing a different instrument because all that tonal characteristic is gone, but of course the spectral envelope is there and you can at least still recognize the original song. However, of course, and that's when it also gets interesting to educate listeners about how different um, signals can actually influence different artifacts. If you now would have something which is much more tonal in the original, then of course substituting something which is a tone by a noise-like component does not really work that well. And for that, I would like to show you the example of the glockenspiel here. This is the original. And here again, the version where everything above eight kilohertz have been replaced by noise. And here I, well, oops. and here you can, I think already hear that it sounds a bit more uh, fuzzy and less clean than the original glockenspiel. And if you go down here to two kilohertz, it will become already pretty obvious. And it, it really sounds noisy and actually somewhat out of tune because the, the harmonics no longer match because there are not really harmonics, but noise signals. And of course, last but not least, I'd like to also play here the 500 Hertz version to make it very obvious. And once again, I think here it's of course very obvious and it's basically become a different instrument because all of those tonal components are replaced by noise. Of course, in a real world um, audio codec, typically one of the much higher quality levels would be chosen, but I think it's very good for training listeners or for um, getting a feeling yourself how an effect can sound if you have it at a really strong variant where you can hear something very obviously and then it's also t easier to recognize this effect at the lower um, severeness levels. And this was one of the new chapters from the parametric coding. We also have some more on bandwidth extension and parametric stereo and multi-channel coding, which I will not go into here for the sake of time. However, last but not least, one chapter that I would like to mention here is actually on subjective evaluation because now we have um, already seen and heard that there are quite a lot of different effects and artifacts that can go on in such a um, perceptual audio coder. And of course, these are all things, as Jürgen mentioned earlier, which cannot really be measured easily in terms of SNR and different effects may actually disturb different people in different ways. So one person might prefer one artifact over the other and so on. So we need actually a good way to measure perceptual quality. And for that, we need good methods for subjective testing. And one method that is often used in perceptual audio coding and assessment of perceptual audio codecs is the so-called MASHRA test, which is a multi-stimulus with hidden reference and anchors methodology, which is standardized by the ITU. And this basically is a blind listening test where you would 
present an open reference and several conditions without labels. Uh, well, labeled one, two, three, but not telling people what they're actually listening to and present that on yeah, some kind of graphical user interface where you can seamlessly switch between an open reference, um, different conditions under test, and also a hidden reference and some anchors. And then people can rate their perceived quality in comparison to the reference on a 100 point quality scale, which goes from bad, poor, fair, good, up to excellent. So there are also some quality labels associated. So you get a feeling for yeah, what quality you perceive something to be. And then this is collected over many listeners. And then you can do some statistics and evaluate the actual quality that a given codec or tuning um, working point of a codec is perceived to be at. And for that, of course, it's important to have actually somewhat trained and expert listeners that are really um, used to recognizing and comparing different artifact types. And for that, I think this tutorial is also a helpful resource to build listener expertise. And in that regard, um, the last um, feature that I would like to show here is that for several of the artifacts that I just showed you, we actually also have um, scores or average scores from expert listeners, how they would rate those different conditions. And they are given on this page here. And for instance, for where is it uh, for for the examples that we just listened to earlier with the birdie artifacts, um, we can see that of course the original would be rated hopefully at hundred. So there's a hidden reference in the in the test to basically check if people recognize that, also to test somewhat the listeners. And then here are the scores for the different degradations. And let me play that once again. This would be the original. Selfish and, mean and, everything I did. and here is a version that would be, well, around half of that scale. So at 48 points. Selfish and mean and everything I did. So I'm not sure if it comes across well over the Zoom connection. It might still sound pretty pretty good here. Um, but if we go down to the severely distorted version, which would in a yeah, formal test score around 20, so in the, in the bad region, um, we can again clearly hear the differences. Selfish and mean and everything I did. Yeah, and I, I think this is also something which is a nice thing that you can do and actually listen to the um, different artifacts on the individual um, tutorial sites up here where there are actually no scores given for reference, but by yourself, basically think for yourself, well, how would I rate this in terms of quality and maybe write it down for yourself. And then you can go here to this quality assessment page and have a look at how others have rated that quality. And with that, I would like to um, conclude on this short walkthrough. I think um, you've gotten an, an overview of what um, kind of demonstrations, but also technical possibilities with the switching of different spectrograms and so on we have here in our tutorial. And hopefully this can help you all get more and better listeners and all become experts in actually knowing what to listen for in perceptual audio codex. And with this, I would like to hand back over to Jürgen. Thank you so much, Sasha. That was very nice. So let me try to wrap the screen for um, getting a, uh, let's see, yes. Doing a few wrap up slides. Um, so um, what we've seen here is not the, the result of um, a single person's effort, but uh, there have been many contributions that went into that. And uh, especially, <clears throat> I'd like to express 
special thanks to the contributors from the AES coding TC. So you could see here uh, the, the long list of, of contributors. Everyone has been pushed to contribute something and, and I'm happy to have Marina here also on, on the talk here. I'd also like to say thank you for, to Fraunhofer IS because they really provided resources for converting the original um, HTML code into something that now uses all the possibilities of HTML5. So these are seamless built-in audio players and you can switch between uh, the, the, the spectrograms as you saw. So that is quite nice. And last but not least, I'd like to say thank you very much for the University of Erlangen Nuremberg uh, that provides the web hosting of the tutorial material, specifically Stefan Trotsky. So um, here's the single, simple takeaway. So we have created this education mater educational material, and we hope that you will find it useful for getting an well, almost expert listener if you want to. And so this second generation web edition has a better format for easy access and better user experience. We've got the extended content with more chapters and more audio coding techniques. And uh, as we said before, it's available for free for everyone here. And so once again, here's the URL. And um, if you wanna take a snapshot here, there's the QR code. So thank you so much. And I think that answers the presentation part of things. And I think we can move over to the other link, uh, but uh, Anna will tell us. Yes, thank you so much for the presentation and the walkthrough. I'm really excited to try it out now. Uh, but before I'll do that, um, we'll move to the Q&A and discussion. I already posted the link uh, to the uh, chat. So please join us uh, there and yeah, looking forward to the discussion and Q&A. And thank you for attending everyone uh, in case you don't want to join the discussion. Hope to see you soon and for the next research colloquium. <laughs>